Um, I, I, um, um, we're a cross-community organisation that has been funded for the last 10, uh, 14 years by Forest of Gilliga and we're supposed to acknowledge Forest of Gilliga's funding at all public occasions. So this is just to tell you that cutting our funding at the end of June should not be acknowledged. <laughs> um, I, I have a very firm belief that um, uh, nobody um, understands any society um, at any particular time without understanding where that society came from. So I'm going to contextualise the early Irish language movement in Northern Ireland by abandoning my title and concentrating on the prehistory of the Irish language movement in Northern Ireland. Um, the formative years of the language movement that kind of rolled on into it. The real reason actually is that I have too much to say and I get stuck in 1922. Um, the, the, uh, Northern Ireland of course didn't exist until the morning. Uh, uh, Northern Ireland did not exist until 1921 or, or uh, 20 or 21. Um, so there's two possible geographical kind of units um, uh, for the earlier period that are meaningful. Uh, one of them is the ten historic uh, counties of Ulster. Uh, I say ten counties of Ulster because uh, they spoke Ulster Irish in County Louth, and the Louth Gaelic had the same uh, importance to the language movement in, 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 in the rest of Ulster at the early period as the Donegal Gaelic had in, 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 the, in the later period. The other uh, focus and the main focus actually will be in Belfast. Now, this is not just because I'm from Belfast, it's not just because of kind of uh, a sense of local patriotism, but Belfast was the crucible of the, in most ways, the crucible of the language movement, the, li the revival movement in the northern quarter of this island. Whether we date that from 1895 uh, when the branch of the Gaelic League was formed in Belfast or go back another century, and I'm briefly going to go back another century. The late 18th and the early 19th centuries saw a unique uh, pro uh, prototype kind of, of lang language movement um, in the north, again centred in Belfast. So when other contemporary um, organisations concerned with the Irish language engaged solely in either antiquarian activities or evangelical activities, um, a section of the northern Presbyterian middle class Protestant uh, 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 intelligentsia took pragmatic measures towards the attainment of uh, an idealistic objective than that of maintaining the Irish language as a living language. It wasn't, it wasn't just antiquarian, they actually wanted to keep the language alive. And they took actions to do it. The only ones who did. Um, even if you look at, say, the, the Belfast Harp Festival um, of 1792, that was not just a diddly dee hooly. It was also set out to record and transmit to future generations the Gaelic airs and the words of Gaelic song. That was part of their, their, their song plan. The organisers, who the people who set up that festival, later on, twice set up harp schools for blind young children uh, in, in Belfast to learn the harp, to, kind of, to maintain that tradition. Um, in 1808, the Reverend William Nielsen, a uh, Presbyterian clergyman from a uh, native speaker of Irish from County Down, published an Irish grammar. And again, this was a, a, it belonged to the same ethos. It was the first grammar book to teach the living language. And in this case, it was the Irish, the dialect of County Down. Um, and this is Nielsen's. And Nielsen, Nielsen dedicated the book not to one Lord Lieutenant, but to two Lord Lieutenants. So Nielsen was, in fact, a, 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 we would now call him a Unionist. The term didn't exist then. Mm -hmm. This is his attitude. He knew this basically because he was uh, 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 he taught Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and and, and when on his deathbed he was he was uh, appointed to the chair of a class, the classical chair in Oxford University as a scholar. F um, fascinating man. The Ulster Gaelic Society was then founded in 1830, and this was the first organisation in Ireland that wanted to maintain Irish as a living language. They had a, a declared interest. 
Uh, that, that galaxy of interesting people, but because I'm so speaking of the Irish, on the other hand, I'm going to skip them all except one. This is uh, the show secretary, a young fellow who is 23 years of age, called Robert McAdam, um, who, who collected manuscripts, founded the Ulster Journal of Archaeology, collected folk tales and songs, employed Gaelic scribes in his foundry in Townsend Street, uh, and got a question on knowledge of Irish put into the 1851 census and then compiled an English-Irish dictionary, the first attempt to record the living language again. It was focused on the, 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 the living tongue. And this is McAdam's perspective on the language. Now, as far as I can make out, it's very hard to work out what McAdam's politics were, but he seems to have been a unionist because he composed uh, a verse in praise of Queen Victoria when she got to Belfast in uh, 1841, 1849. Um, and this is what he wrote. And this is an extraordinary foreword that he wrote to this dictionary, which is in Queen's University at the moment. And the reason he wrote it was, Meds Magyan, er Mahir Huvish, of this Lichaskara Danchangi. And uh, it's translated below here. Now, that, this particular movement died out uh, in the second half of the, the 19th century. However, McAdam survived to, into the new era, just about. Uh, he was still alive when the Gaelic League was founded in 1893. And he died the year that the Belfast branch of the Gaelic League was founded. So you've got this thin thread of continuity. Now, 1885 is the, is the usual date for the language movement in Northern Ireland because that was when the Belfast branch was set up. It was the, there were, 1885, the, the, uh, the Gaelic League had only had one branch basically uh, from the first two years of its existence. And in 1885, two branches were set up, one in uh, Belfast and the other one in Glasgow, where my father was working on a pressure tunnel, my grandfather, my grandfather was working on a pressure tunnel and was attending Irish classes in Glasgow, where he learned Monster Irish, which is kind of very extraordinary. Um, but the movement in Belfast had kind of started even earlier than that, because in 1892, this is before the Gaelic League was founded, there was something in the air. The Belfast Naturalist Field Club set up an Irish class in the premises of Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society. Uh, that, you'll all know that as the old museum building in College Square North. The teacher was a man called P.S. O'Shea. There were actually three people called P.S. O'Shea in Belfast at the time. Uh, he was a native speaker of Irish from Kerry and had been posted to Belfast by the Customs and Mail Service, as had the other two P.S. O'Shea. They're all called Patrick <laughs> Joseph O'Shea, every single one of them. And they all took on uh, various uh, 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 pen names. This particular P.S. O'Shea, his pen name was Conan Whale, uh, which means Baldy Conan. Uh, it was one of the, fem the, 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 the more outrageous of the, the uh, film McCool's companions. Um, and uh, uh, his baldness might have been in the head, but it's possibly in one version of one of the stories was not in his head at all. But I won't have time to tell you that story. <laughs> <laughs> it was the opposite of his head. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, anyway, uh, P.S. O'Shea uh, uh, was teaching this class. Now, the field club um, movement, uh, was, it was, this is a UK wide movement, a very interesting movement. It, it combined a strong um, self improvement ethos uh, with, with, with what for the time was a remarkably advanced sense of, of social inclusion. Well, it, it was essentially middle class, for middle class educated young people, but they also attracted and allowed working class members who were interested in their area of work. And they also allowed, and they were talking about the 1880s, women. And they all had bicycles and they all cycled all over the place. So there was this revolution, there was a social revolution based on bicycles and girls uh, uh, that, 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 that happened. So, by the, basically, by the, by, uh, at this time, the, the, these clubs, this club had become the, a magnet uh, 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 for the bright young things of the period because of this kind of sense of freedom that they had. And although O'Shea, uh, who was a caring man, described it as a sombre body, it probably offered the nearest thing to a, an intellectual bohemian uh, lifestyle that Belfast could offer. Um, 
Um, and it's not entirely surprising that this um, such a gathering, predominantly led by young middle class Protestants, should take up the Irish language, um, uh, which was, as I say, was in the air at the time. From this, or the, from this club, the first branch of the Gaelic League was formed in 1895. Um, and the, the, the inaugural meeting was hosted by um, another customs and mail officer. Customs and mail feature very, very largely in this, in this, in this story. Uh, called uh, uh, Father McGinley, uh, Donegal man, who spent 19 years in, in, in England and had just arrived back in, in Ireland. And, and the first meeting was in his house in the, on the Beersbridge Road. Um, and this is McGinley. Now you can't see him terribly clear. I have a better picture of him. This is him on the front of, of the British Store in Gaelic. It was the, the Gaelic Journal in 1903. But this is what he kind of looked like, right? Um, note the, the, the kilt was undoubtedly saffron uh, and possibly explains why the, the Antrim uh, GAA wears saffron, not yellow. Uh, 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 on a, on a, uh, shirts. The cloak is not your 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 uh, what do you call the thing to throw over your, the shoulder? The the pledge, the plaid, the plaid. The plaid. Uh, this is a genuine imitation, uh, ancient Irish cloak with all those things uh, hanging down from it. There bits of wool that are sort of sewn onto it, and it went all the way to the floor. The shoes and socks are probably modern. Uh, he wore this a lot when he was elected to the Senate. He was appointed to the Senate by Devil Lear in the 1930s, and uh, uh, he wore a kilt then. And he had a son, two sons, I think, who always wore kilts. One of them finished up as a doctor in, 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 uh, in the Central Gale Fact in Dewey, and he was known as Dr. Big Skirta. <laughs> <laughs> the me doctor with a skirt. Um, he was he was small as well, and under that Thomas Shanter, which is not authentic, he was bald. Um, now, um, yes, uh, McGinley had caused a lot of consternation in the Irish language circles, as such as they were at Belfast uh, uh, in 1895, uh, because everybody had been used to the melodious Gaelic of Munster. But everything is just very round, like that tall, they say. And he spoke from the back of the room, and, uh, and Alice Milligan talks about hearing this harsh voice like a crow, sort of baiting and roaring to the back of the room. So, the, 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 as I say, the, the, as I say the, this was not the Irish that people were used to at all. Um, so, anyway, they set up this, this class. But nobody bothered to inform the Belfast Natural uh, uh, History and Philosophic Society that they had become a branch of the Gaelic League. So whenever they turned up for the next class, which had been going for the last three years, they were thrown out. <laughs> so the first class of the Belfast uh, branch of the Gaelic League in Belfast was held in a cold day, I think it was November, in uh, 19, 1895 in the doorway of Robinson and Cleavers. The class could not have been too big. It was a big doorway, but it wasn't obviously a big class. Um, and they eventually found premises in the Belfast Art Society in, in 49 Queen Street. Now, the original makeup of this Belfast branch was like that of the Fiend Club. It was remarkably inclusive. It, it had an inclusive ethos. Its founders certainly went out of their way to ensure a broad front. Patrons included the Catholic Bishop of Down and Connor, the Church of Ireland Bishop of Down, Connor and Dromore, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church of Ireland, and a galaxy of clergy of all denominations. I'm going to concentrate on two of these clergy because they, they, these people challenge all of your stereotypes. Uh, one of them was the redoubtable uh, Reverend R. R. Cain. Uh, Grand Master of the Belfast Orange Lodge. Now, three years earlier, he had been the chief organiser of the Anti-Home Rule Convention. And it is he who ensured that in the pavilion in, 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 in uh, the Botanic Gardens, there were two good big signs on the pavilion. One said it said, uh, God save the Queen. And the other said it said, Aaron Gabra, Aaron Forever. Uh, he was an All-Ireland Unionist. Um, 
from Calvin. That's why he was not a <laughs> um, He was also noted for fiery denunci denunciations of, 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 of popery. Now, Cain first came to, to, to prominence, uh, public prominence, in a speech that he made in 1880 during the Land War. And during the Land War, um, uh, the Land War was, 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 was tackled in all sorts of ways. Uh, one was the boycott that had been introduced during, during the Land War. But the, the Land War also involved shooting landlords and shooting their agents. And given the kind of the sectarian sort of uh, uh, class uh, structure of Ireland at the time, most of the landlords and a lot of the agents were living Protestants. So this is um, Cain's repost to the shooting of the landlords. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. Uh, this is another example of a kit. Um, uh, note the Irish national costumes of speciality. These are versions of what uh, uh, Irish things could look like. But this is uh, Richard Rutledge Cain. Let us organise a Protestant individual knife protection society and let each member of the society be furnished with the best weapons manufactured and know how to use it. And for every Protestant shot in cold blood, let the responsible officers of the society issue their decree against the priests of the parish in which the murder was committed and the Home Rule member or members for the county and let them pay the penalty for the hard crime they may have prevented. He also organised, he, 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 he had the church in uh, uh, Durham Street, that is now the library of, of uh, um, Inst. And he used to organise the odd brat uh, outside there as well. Now, I'm not presenting him as a role model for anybody. What I'm, I'm, I'm introducing our, our cane to show me just how diverse these passionate gales were. Um, uh, uh, we don't know if Cain could speak Irish. It said that he, he, he signed the minutes of the, 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 the Lodge meetings in, in Irish. And I have met people who have met people who have seen these. Uh, but I've never I've met anybody who has actually seen them himself. Um, I've never seen them myself. Um, the other one is in, is a, is in ways a more interesting man. There's a common John Baptist Crozier, the vicar of Down, um, was in Hollywood uh, when he became involved in the Gaelic League. He later became Archbishop of Armagh and Primate of All Ireland. In 1912, as uh, Archbishop, he was also chaplain to the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland. Now, again, he was from Cavan. Um, but Calvin, in his youth, would have had uh, quite a number of, of Irish speakers. In fact, there were still Irish speakers in Calvin up until the 30s and 40s of this century. Um, and he won a prize in Irish when he was at Trinity College, Dublin. Now, his, 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 uh, his attitude to Irish was that of a, a unionist uh, patriot. These words are, you know, patriot has become tended to be used in, in, in uh, for nationalists. But uh, throughout the 19th and the late 18th century, patriot did not designate whether a nationalist or a unionist, but had a nationalist or a unionist tendency. And he said, it's nothing less than a disgrace that people who love their country should know nothing of its language, he said. And he campaigned in the 1890s to have Irish taught in the national schools. And he certainly had a, fine grasp of, a firm grasp of, of the language. This is something he wrote when he was leaving Hollywood. It was a, it was a, it was a speech he gave. Now, you need to parse that. It's quite a complicated sentence. As full of the and Caelagus, a mass cutchin er a changi, Saudia, hockey, medu, er vast, and any da Caela, a rubra, natura, a spragu, er ian. That's like a that's like a line out of out of, out of the Aeneid, uh, in, in terms of its of its of its, stru of its structure. But it is real in Irish, and there isn't a single mistake in it. Uh, we Gales spend an awful lot of time looking at each other's Irish and looking for mistakes. No mistakes. Grammatically correct. A wee bit, a wee bit pedantic, but grammatically correct. Now, uh, the, patron, the patrons were led by a liberal unionist, uh, uh, Dr. John Sinclair Boyd, who, 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 who ran uh, the Lyon Hospital in the bottom of the Lisburn Road. It included uh, Francis Joseph Bigger, who you probably know was a, a Protestant nationalist romantic, a bibliophile, an indef indefatigable committee man, and a dabbler in literature, history, folklore, traditional music, kilts, and nonsense. He ran around the kilt as well, saffron, of course. 
because that was the tradition. Now, they were also included O'Shea and McGinley um, were also patrons, and they were possibly an, an, an atypical in being uh, Catholics from Irish-speaking districts and nationalists, and as we will see, they uh, became quite fierce uh, nationalists. The Gaelic Journal noted the, the range of men membership the following May, claiming that the language, and this is a quote, would, could, would unite in honest and thoroughgoing sympathy on thoroughly national grounds, Irish men whose religious and political principles are sundered as the poles. That was written by the editor, a man called J.J. Lloyd, um, uh, uh, who was from a Protestant Union's background himself, and we're not terribly sure what his politics were at this period, but towards the end of his life he, he actually was a, 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 a unionist. Um, uh, he did extraordinary work in, 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 in developing the language and editing, and editing manuscripts. And in fact, he read the first edition of the Deneen Dictionary twice and corrected it for Patrick Deneen. He's an extraordinary scholar. Um, now, um, now, Sinclair Boyd at the AGM in, in 1886 uh, after, uh, reported a growth in the membership from uh, 22, that's what the start does, to 120 within a, within a year. And Sinclair Boyd again echoed the same principles. It is pleasant to state that the society includes members of all creeds and classes uh, being strictly non political and non sectarian. Um, creeds, yes. Classes, no. Uh, it was a very, a very middle class um, um, organisation at that time. Now, the actual, the, the general membership, aside from the, 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 the patrons, has not been analysed in depth. Uh, but the active members, uh, again, represent a colourfully wide um, range of backgrounds. Uh, among those who, 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 who um, attended classes in the early days was Mary Hutton. Is the wife of a Unitarian minister and a formidable scholar in, in her own right. There's Rosemont Young of Galgorn Castle um, uh, uh, near Ballymena. Uh, she was involved in an early stage and in the, in the 20s and 30s she published a three volume anthology of um, Irish Gaelic poetry that in the West has not been superseded. Uh, this is one of them. That Roish Ni Ogan. Well, there. I always thought that was Rose Hogan. Uh, 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 but it is Rose Maud Young. Uh, this is the book my mother used uh, um, um, at school as her, as her textbook in the 1930s. Um, she was an aunt, uh, Rose Maud Young was an aunt of uh, Lady Brookborough, that's the latest of the Lady Brookboroughs. Uh, her brother was one of the chief organisers of the Laren Gun Rowing and uh, 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 they were a very prominent Unionist family and she appears to have been a Unionist. Uh, all her life, unlike her friend Ada McNeil, who was a uh, uh, who was a first cousin of Lord Cushington and was a roaring Republican, um, um, she'd been influenced by Roger Casement, or vice versa. It's not terribly sure who influenced whom. The sculptor Rosemary Prager was a member. Was involved. A man called Hugh McMillan, who was the son of a Presbyterian minister, uh, and published under the, the the pen name of Amy McGregor. Uh, collected the folklore of Rathlin and the word hordes of Rathlin and the Glens of Antrim and collected folklore in Inishman and in, in, in Galway and in Benetta and in, in the Sparrow Mountains. Eamon O'Toole later published Gaelic folk tales from Tyrone and Calvin from the, 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 the remaining Gael texts there. Um, and among the, 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 the nationalists and among the Catholics, if you like, and the politically radical were um, Alva O'Monaghan. Uh, an artist who later took part in the 1916 raising in Dublin, and Cahill of Shannon, who was a, a, a journalist but a, an active in the labour movement, uh, fairly left wing, and also a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, a secret organisation. It included Alice Milligan, who was uh, the poet, playwright, feminist, uh, and socialist, and political activist, um, and Bulmer Hobson. Uh, of Quaker sort of descent, but not quite a Quaker because he was also one of the, uh, the people who organised and revitalised the Irish Republican Brotherhood, along with Danny McCullough. Now, um, then, you know, joining the Gaelic League is one thing, learning Irish is something else 
um, uh, as some of us have found out. Uh, not necessarily the easiest thing in the world. And most people went to classes, made classes, but a few had more unorthodox ways of, of, of learning it. Uh, Seamus O'Kelly learned the language in the Sperns uh, during summer holidays with his grandparents. Uh, uh, his family had a pub on the, on the Falls Road, but the grandparents were from the country. Cahill O'Boyle was the father of the folklore collector, the folk song collector, uh, Sean O'Boyle. Um, he, his, his way of learning Irish was to, he used to walk around uh, Belfast at night in the company of an RIC uh, 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 policeman who was from Kerry, because what they used to do in those days was would, uh, the Christian Brothers were even doing it in my time was that they would be posted as far from home as possible. So Belfast was full of Kerry men and Cork men and Tipperary men, and not one of these people were native speakers. So again, Cattle was learning um, the wrong Irish, basically, from this, uh, from this policeman. Um, Sean McMullen uh, uh, had come down from Belfast as in the age of 9 or 10 uh, from Glenariff, got involved in the Gaelic League, Discovered that there was a Gael tucked in Calivi in South Armagh and down there found it wasn't as strong. Somebody in Calivi told him that they'd better ice over the hill and down, down across the water in Omeath. So he used to take the train from Belfast to Newry, take another train out to our, uh, to our point, walk a wee bit and then take a ferry across to Omeath every Saturday and walk up in the hills and talk to the, 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 people, the, the, the people there. Came back, haven't learned Irish after a couple of years. Discovered that his father was a native speaker of Glens of Mount Mary, so he had, he, had, he, had, he, had, he had at least two dialects, and then he married a character from Donegal. <laughs> so he had three dialects in a, 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 of Irish, all of which he could speak accurately. Uh, I, I, I now, I've been talking about these places where Irish had survived. These are, these are more or less they, right? Um, this is, these are the areas in the north where in 1911, and, uh, and obviously, these are the older. This is the older generations. This is the this is the first uh, census where uh, it's broken down into DED dead electoral districts. So, uh, but the, the rest the rest of the, the language knowledge is broken down into Barnes, which is too wide. So it shows where those concentrations uh, of speakers were. One of the interesting ones is Rathlin Island, and I, I uh, when I was preparing this, I was going to do something in Rathlin Island, uh, and didn't because. I discovered that uh, if you look up the census, you can do it online now and do it in Irish. You get nobody in Rathen Irish who speaks Irish. You have to look up Irish and English, and uh, uh, you discover uh, uh, that you have 111 people can speak Irish and English. And then you look up English and Irish, you discover that there's another 14 can speak English and Irish. And then you look up other, and you find that there's all sorts of people in Rathlin Island who don't speak anything, and actually <laughs> don't have jobs. Uh, uh, basically all you've got is a, is, 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 is a name, and then you go into them individually, and you discover that these people have filled in the census form in Irish. Or maybe they haven't filled in the census form in Irish, because most of the rating is remarkably similar. Uh, so I think there was possibly a literacy in Irish at that time would not have been terribly widespread. And there was one person who had herself down as a, as a, 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 a language organiser. So I think part of her organising might have been to fill in the forms. But I, 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 there's some of the people that I know were Irish speakers who had filled in their form in Irish or had it filled in for them. Turns out that 55, 6-7% of the people of Rathlin Island were Irish speakers. It was a population of 300. So that was possibly the strongest uh, area. More very strong area in the middle of the uh, of the uh, of, of the Sparrows there. And then pockets in Fermanagh, pockets in, in, in even in County Down. Um, and the, the, you know, the, the, the Belfast Naturalist Field Club went out on a, on a train and then bicycles, as you did around the Bourne Mountains, looking for Irish speakers and finding them. Uh, uh, Kieran Devon has done, has done uh, uh, sort of work on that, I don't know if we've got the names yet. Um, but part of the work of, 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 of these people was, as I've noted before, um, collecting the folklore and traditions of, 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 of these areas. Right. The language movement also had success in a number of other institutional ways. It mainstreamed the language in, a, in quite interesting ways in, 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 
Um, it, 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 it was being done through the national schools anyway, on a voluntary basis. The individual national schools could opt into teaching Irish um, um, at this period. But again, they needed to be encouraged, and of course the teachers had to be taught Irish. And Belfast was to the fore in those, in both encouraging schools and uh, uh, training teachers. Um, but they, 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 for example, they got a professor of Irish um, appointed to St Mary's Girls uh, uh, at Training College uh, for teachers. Um, the man was Father Garage O'Neillan, who was a, a, an uncle of uh, Brian O'Neillan, better known possibly as Mays the Goblin, or Flannel Brown to the rest of you. Mm -hmm. his, his father spoke Tory Island Irish, and um, um, Father Garage O'Neillan spoke Munster Irish, Cork Irish to be specific. Uh, so again, you had another invasion of Cork, of Munster Irish, into, 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 into Belfast. Um, they, they, they also set up two like, in-service colleges for teachers. This is to kind of fast-track teachers to be able to teach Irish to kids. So this is to, uh, uh, practicing teachers would then be taught Irish. They set up one, the first one was set up um, uh, uh, with Monster Irish, and then another one was set up for Ulster Irish. <laughs> uh, and there's a, there's a wonderful dialect word that I won't have time to go into. Queen's University was quite interesting as well because in 1906, uh, a young medical student, um, uh, uh, along with, with Professor um, uh, R.M. Henry, who was a professor of classics in Queens at the time, the two of them set up the Gaelic Society in 1906. The young student, medical student, was called um, William MacArthur, and he was a Presbyterian who had learned Irish on holidays in Donegal, in, in, in West Donegal, in an area where Irish has, has, has disappeared. Um, Henry was a, 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 a political nationalist, um, and basically Henry would have done anything to annoy his union's colleagues, uh, 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 and, and, and did, so he, he got he put through his weight behind this particular thing. Um, William MacArthur finished his days as, this is, as Lieutenant General Sir William MacArthur, DSO, OBE, CB, KCB, BB, CB, CHBA, there's a bit which which was with Bell Books, that's another one of the other Professor of Tropical Medicine in, uh, uh, in, in the Army um, Hospital. Uh, he married a French woman and made her learn Irish, and then he brought up two sons speaking Irish. A lot of it in Singapore, she had these things to do. To uh, trilingual children speaking French, English, and Irish in Singapore, um, and, and uh, uh, he wrote uh, he, he wrote an introduction to the 50-year celebration of of the, of the Gaelic Society uh, in the most beautiful Irish, absolutely limpid, beautifully Irish. Um, then the Gael they, they, they also um, the Gaelic Society in Queens was was in its early days absolutely fascinating. It, like the early Gaelic League, it transcended um, um, sectarianism. It, it, this is one of, the, one of the kind of indirect evidence. Fifty people turned up at the inaugural meeting. That's more than twice the number of Catholics who are at, at Queen's College at the time. So by default, if you were at Queen's and you were and you were there and you were and there, was, and there were more than twenty of you, the rest were bound to be Protestant. The, 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 the society um, continued right up to, uh, with this kind of inclusive ethos and practice uh, up until the beginning of the First World War. But in, in a history that was written by Sean McArch in, the, in 50, 1956, um, he, he constantly goes back to attempts to make it inclusive again and fails. So there's always these sincere attempts to make it inclusive, but no take up uh, for reasons I'll be coming to later on. There had been no professor of Irish or lecturer in Irish in Queens since the great scholar John O'Donovan had, had died in 1861. Henry and MacArthur, between them, uh, managed to persuade the, the college to adopt a lecture in Irish. And the fellow that they got, um, again, it was, it was diplomatically uh, sort of very cleverly done because the lecture they got 
was a Church of Ireland clergyman called uh, 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 O'Connell, who happened uh, um, to be a native speaker of Connemara Irish. Um, a great scholar, very interesting man, a great scholar, a fair writer, uh, uh, but a totally useless teacher. Uh, uh, it is quite probable that nobody learned any Irish from uh, O'Connell, although he did enliven the, 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 the world because he did, he did an edition of uh, the, the Midnight Court in Irish that had no dirty words in uh, uh, which is an extraordinary achievement and hardly worth reading. Uh, he, he, uh, 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 but again, even, even by bringing in a, a Church of Ireland clergyman to teach Irish in Queen's College, which is the one for unions basically, all the other um, colleges uh, in the Dublin Court and Galway were for, 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 for Catholics. The Queen's was uh, uh, for the Protestants and unions. Uh, some other Church of Ireland clergyman got his beard in a blaze and, and wrote denouncing him uh, for promoting Irish uh, in the local uh, newspapers. And there was a great controversy around this and, and, and O'Connell had, had to get police protection uh, uh, during his first year or so um, at the college. He was eventually, his incompetence eventually ca uh, caught up with him. Uh, 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 some, some one of his students who claimed that she hadn't heard anything from him and he was sacked. Um, uh, then he, he went and became the second in command of the precursor of Radio Iron and uh, got knocked down by a bus uh, and killed um, and then taken to Galway, back home to Galway to be, I don't know, I don't know what, anyway, it had, been decided, it had been decided by somebody in Galway that he had turned Catholic in the meantime because he was friendly with the entire part of Lera. and uh, whenever the coffin came there was a crowd, there was a mob in Clifton that took the coffin and tried to bury it in the Catholic graveyard. <laughs> there's, a, there's a wonderful, wonderful story there somewhere that somebody should, co should cover. Uh, and when he was a student at Trinity, he had, he had, he had, uh, he had, he had set up an organisation uh, called the Driha, and the, the only rule against that in the Driha was that you weren't allowed to speak sense. Uh, when you were there, and you could speak any language but English. Uh, uh, he, he was, he was a uh, mob. Uh, anyway, um, and anybody talking about um, politics or religion while um, being a, 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 a member of this organisation would be expelled. This was picked up, uh, this was the same rule that MacArthur had, um, because MacArthur's um, um, Rule for this. Uh, this is from the, the the rules of the Gaelic Society in Queens at the time. Any member introducing a religious or political subject at any time shall cease to be a member. That's probably illegal now. But uh, uh, again, this was he wasn't so much if you like non-political as anti-political where the language was concerned. Basically, the language had to be protected from things he thought, and I think he was right. Now, again. The big problem was, Belfast was an English-speaking city. How do you promote the Irish language in an English-speaking city? You had to teach people Irish. So they had uh, uh, teaching Irish all over the place. Uh, three courses that I know of were, 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 uh, uh, were, were, were created in Belfast. Um, the first one was in 1902. And it was done um, um, by McGinley. That's McGinley, that's the fellow with the kilt, sorry, earlier, earlier, who was doing everything. It was based on the Gouin method. The Gouin method is this method of teaching where you have these kind of wee mini dramas with actions. Yeah, so it's, it's a verb based course. And Colonel Alvin Folk, Baron Martin, people, you do the actions as well. And it's actually been sort of found since since then some uh, studies, uh, recent studies have, have, have kind of shown that acting out the, the, the language does actually help to, to, to um, uh, root the, um, the new language in, in your head. Uh, I mean how many people are going to be using that? It's not, it, was a, it was a very very forward looking course in its time. The other uh, course um, the second course was read by, uh, it was created by a man called Shano Khan. Shano Khan was a learner of Irish who had joined the Customs and Mail and learned Irish in London, then came over to Belfast and of course in London he learned Munster Irish. Uh, that was in Munster Irish then, uh, more or less. Um, and he set up a training school for the teachers uh, 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 and in-service courses for the teachers. 
and um, more than 90 teachers, two thirds of them uh, who are national school teachers, um, looking for this college certificate because this was recognised by the Department of Education, um, was set, uh, uh, followed his courses. So Khan's approach was quite different to this. This was a kind of an oral approach uh, for classes. This other one approach is massively grammatical. And this is the description of the rooms in which the classes were taught. And uh, it said, uh, the, this is the, in the Gillick League's new headquarters, the walls of which this says were, um, were decorated with all sorts of language charts and all strange looking, looking phonetic diagrams, charts and pictures. Uh, and and, and uh, the, the article describes uh, has a sentence, and this article, this article has a, a sentence in Irish at the end of it says, He said, You would think you're in a doctor's surgery. Because <laughs> basically, there's all these cross sections of your head where you're talking. You? There are approximately, there's somewhere between 25 and 30 sounds in Irish that don't exist in English. So, to get the sounds correctly, you basically have to manipulate your, 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 your tongues and your lips and your all sorts of things. Uh, and uh, to get them right. So he had this old diagram, all these diagrams. Unfortunately, of course, he was giving the monster sign. And there are only two L's in monster, and there are four L's in Ulster. So it was quite inadequate and also the wrong dialect. <laughs> um, uh, th th this course didn't just do pronunciation and grammar, they did old Irish, they did history, they did literature. And uh, uh, and uh, a problem of uh, lectures um, and public lectures and stuff. The third course was uh, created later on in the, uh, in, the, in the second decade of the 20th century, um, and published in 1919. Um, and again, possibly a bit coincidence, the brother and father of the man who wrote it were in the Customs and Mail. Uh, as I say, the customs of mail keeps on appearing in the, in the, in the story uh, in, in all sorts of strange ways. Father Donald of Tull, uh, um, a Catholic priest, had learned Irish. He had not been posted up to the Glens of Antrim and discovered he was in a Gale Tract and learned Irish from the old people there. Uh, and then came back to Belfast uh, and began to teach uh, uh, in Belfast. And he, 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 he developed this course. Uh, oh, this is a description of, 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 of him. Um, in and around this time. He died quite young, he died in the early 20s. This small, delicate, keen eyed priest whose dress was stippled over with chalk and classroom dust. He appears to have been an absolutely uh, wonderful teacher. Um, and, and again, under nurtured mill workers is important there. This is not, this is no longer the middle class. This is the working class and the, the, and the first of the working class. Uh, uh, that are that are learning Irish and uh, here, uh, which is important for our story here. Um, and this is the the course that we produced. And anybody who has learnt Irish in Belfast and sometimes even in school will have be aware of the uh, the the rain, rinse re, rinse re, rinse this is quite, quite common both in my classes and in, in, in schools. This came from Donald, uh, uh, from this course, and nearly 100 years later, it's still, it's still being used. He had all these kind of posters as well um, uh, that, he, that he, he produced. Now, as I said, undernourished workers, this is the West Belfast, in other words, this is the Fault Road. Uh, and this is very early, this is 1901. Now we're talking about an organisation that started in 1885, and this is 1901. Five hundred members of this branch. Four hundred and forty of them are regular attenders, you always get some new... Uh, Conan Whale, that's the ubiquitous P.S. O'Shea uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier, the man who taught and uh, in, 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 uh, the, the class in, uh, in, in, in Robinson Papers. And if you look at this, this I, f I find this a wee bit alarming. Mm -hmm. The second bit, uh, not just stylistically, it's not just the language, but the sentiment. Um, because it, it, it's, it's been quite interesting because my experience of the Irish language movement in West Belfast is that it, 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 it tends to work on a sort of messiah basis. 
Uh, and there's always one messiah, or maybe two competing messiah, uh, <laughs> who think that they're running the show. Uh, and I don't know if that goes back as far as that. That's certainly been true, I think, since the 1950s. Uh, and I'll name no names. <laughs> right, I, I've done Belfast at the moment because that was basically where it started and where the other branches, most of the branches were taken, people went out in their bicycles and found the branches somewhere else and then they took a train, there were trains all over the place and took a train and found a branch somewhere else. Um, so I'm going to touch on a couple of those very, very briefly because I'm realised that I'm, I've, I've, made, I've given you too many footnotes. And um, um, there was a, a significant change in the language movement, in that this middle class and inclusive organisation, by 1901, its growth was all, all within the Catholic community. You can find very, very few Protestants and no Unionists that I know of who came to the Irish language movement after 1905-1906. I can't trace any at all. Uh, uh, those Protestants who did become involved tended to be Protestant nationalists, which was a, 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 you know, for ideological reasons. And um, I'm going to give you a couple of, I'm just going to run through these very, very quickly. Oh, these are, um, I just forgot about this. Um, these are, are uh, um, um, f uh, basically, this is part of the, the, the Irish Ireland movement here. Um, Everything had to be that. That's Denny McCulloch, Dennis McCulloch, uh, who, along with uh, Wilmer Hobson, revitalised the Irish Pope and Brotherhood. Uh, and it was to, uh, they weren't involved in 1916 raising, but they actually created the, the weather through which it could have happened. And the you know, war pipes is, 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 is kind of significant. The Irish war pipes uh, were basically bagpipes, but they only had two. Uh, drones instead of three drones. You have three drones in Scotland, very important, except two drones. I think based on the picture, that was probably a mistake. Uh, <laughs> this fella here, again, is possibly revealing, this is from 1913. Uh, his, this is Dermot uh, Germ Barnes, right? Uh, all Gaelic wool manufacture, all yarns are Irish spun and woven, and now it's Irish sheep, everything was Irish. Uh, my father killed himself smoking Irish cigarettes. He wouldn't smoke, he wouldn't smoke blues and say, maybe we'll along the Irish Irish women who smoke blues and greens. <laughs> His nickname, Fuan Angal, the hater of the of the Gal, the hater of the foreigner. But Gal can also mean English, right? Uh, uh, it, dep it depends on what context you take it in. So there's you can see, you can see politics uh, 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 arriving here. This is Karl Hardyback, uh, um, show the cure that he was a, a musician, a very fine musician, and recorded um, uh, all sorts of uh, Irish songs in Belfast again. Um, this is the one I was coming on to, outside of Belfast. Port of Down. Yesterday's meeting was not a large one, no more than 200 persons being present. Just imagine a small meeting of 200 people <laughs> setting up a branch to Haiti League. Um, but nevertheless, I feel that the young men and women are going to give account of themselves in this very uncongenial soil. This is the uncongenial soil of uh, Port of Down. Right? There's a subtext there. There's another not sub not a subtext. Fathers of Connor and Kerr were present. Now it actually says elsewhere in this in this uh, in this particular article that that these two priests had not been involved in the like, language classes that had already been established. But when settled around the Gaelic League, president and vice president, right, in charge. Uh, this is Derry. A couple of days later, uh, four branches in Derry. The college, that's uh, St. Colum, Catholic, uh, the Austin College, Convent, where in the city at large, that is the Catholic and Nationalist element, are glad the young ones are now going to understand uh, some of the secular national schools. Secular national schools are the non Catholic ones, right? Uh, uh, basically, the, the, well, but we would now call Protestant schools uh, are doing nothing. Now, this was, again, this. Teaching Irish in the schools was opt-in, so that actually means that the Protestant schools were not opting in. So what we're looking at here now is is that is is that the inclusivity of the early Gaelic League was not translating to the larger pop the population, the wider population, 
as an inclusive thing, it was growing more or less exclusively within the Catholic and nationalist uh, uh, population. There are Kenny. The bishop is a, that's a misprint, an out and out Gaelic leaguer. Uh, this is Car this is uh, Bishop O'Donnell, the native speaker um, from Donegal, uh, and later Cardinal O'Donnell, um, uh, who was so, uh, uh, kind of a, an extreme, um, um, what do you call it, the extreme version, the ultra ultra Montaigne uh, Catholic, and set up his own version of the Gaelic League in Donegal uh, because the Gaelic League wasn't Catholic enough for it. Um, the, and there is him. His, his lordship was there every night. There's 200 in the school children. children. Um, this actually is a different one here. Uh, this is the, 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 the second bit here, as a mistake I made here, is the, is the Belfast again. That the, 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 the pre uh, was the, 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 the premises in Murray, Murray Street. Murray Street is the street that runs uh, uh, beside Ince. Um, and there's a Glendinning House at the end of the Community Relations Council is, they had that whole building. Uh, uh, it was very, very active. I mean, the, 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 the level of activity in 1906 in Irish and Belfast was extraordinary. But, um, so, one of the interesting things is that um, I'm going to have to move faster than I expected to here. I mentioned Sean McMillan earlier. Sean McMillan was the man from the Glens who had finished up in Belfast. Um, he wrote an autobiography, a very interesting autobiography called Uglanarav to Glasnevin, from Glenarav to Glasnevin. And from the evidence of his book, uh, uh, he was involved in the language movement from the late 90s on, and he doesn't mention uh, Protestants. The, the circles that he moved in, all the names that he, gave, he gives, he gives tend to be tend to be Catholics. So again, that early uh, inclusivity had gone even by the late uh, 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 um, uh, 1800s, or late, uh, late 1890s, in fact. Um, there's a single one single reference in his book to a Protestant Irish speaker, and that was Douglas Hyde, the president of the Gaelic League. And the the incident is actually quite interesting. Um, Douglas Hyde landed in Belfast around 1912, and as you know, 1912 was a kind of a heavy year. Uh, it was the year of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Covenant. Um, and at this stage, there were very, very few Unionists still involved in the language movement, and anybody who was involved got involved earlier on, like Rosemont Young still hanging around, uh, but, but uh, there weren't that many. Hyde's speech, Hyde's speech was held in St Mary's Hall in Bank Street, and when he argued passionately that language enthusiasts should be motivated by love of Ireland rather than hatred of England, Potter McGinley responded, and uh, um, uh, McWillan says, with a twinkle in his eye. And then he gives the quote from uh, um, uh, uh, McGinley in, 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 in English. He says, I agree with the craving. Craving was Hyde's uh, pen name. I agree with Hyde, he says. Uh, but in the absence of that pure love of Ireland, hatred of our English rulers, is not at all a bad working substitute. <laughs> now, this was the man in whose house the inclusive Gaelic League had been founded, right? <laughs> and it kind of gets worse. Um, he wrote in 1913 an article in a magazine, it only had one issue of the magazine, Belfast Specializers in one issue magazines, uh, 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 where he talks about, um, and this is the bit. And because of time, I'm not going to. I'm just going to skip directly to the English. And this is it here. Why do people learn Irish? And then he gives a number of oh, sorry. He gives a number of reasons why they might learn Irish. But ordinary people are not interested in these things. Not your intellectual things. Your your uh, another string to your academic bow. It is because of nationalism alone and dignity and racial pride that alarm. That ordinary people will take trouble to learn their language. Because not, so many of the people in Ireland are in Irish, are in Irish, and they are completely correct. It is Ta and Kurt Apuker Fod, is what he says in, 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 in the Irish. So this uh, movement had, by this time, become a movement, if you like, a cold house for anybody who was not Catholic nationalist. It wasn't too big a cold house for Protestant nationalists. 
fact that they were kind of welcomed. In fact, this article, this article was written in Irish in this magazine. There were two articles in English, uh, uh, sort of talking about how many Protestants were involved in the Irish language. Uh, but this is Union of Skipout, uh, uh, more or less, in, 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 this, in, the, in, the, in this thing. Now, this has had already been happening way back because the Irish Republican Brotherhood, revived from Belfast, had also, as well as the Catholic Church, sort of moving in in a big way in terms of organisation and ideology, the IRB also moved in a big way. This is from um, uh, uh, his translation of uh, Sean T. O. Kelly's autobiography. So he was the, uh, Paddy Pierce hated Sean T. O'Kelly, President of Ireland, in the later days, well, uh, um, because he didn't do any work. He was a distribution monster, uh, manager for Enclave Solish, and he never did anything in terms of distributing. And if he did go out distributing, he spent all his time recruiting. And then Pierce Pierce was very impatient with him. Now, the, I'm going to move on directly to an example because the, all that vibrancy that I talked about in 1906, 1908, 19, all of that, by the time the, the First World War was over, that had gone down quite a lot. By the time the troubles started, they had more or less gone completely. By the time the pogroms in the 20s started, the Irish language movement in Northern Ireland had almost disappeared. Now, I, I haven't been able to find the reference, but I think Liam Andrews, who's actually the expert in this uh, with the field, as is Kieran Devon is the expert in the other field. Yeah, I'm only chance my arm up here, but there's two, there's two real experts in this room. Uh, it, uh, there are only three, um, in 1922, only three branches of the Gaelic League still active. Is that really? It was down and down and down. Down and down and down and down and down. And one of the branches that was still active was in Belfast. And so all of these branches we're talking about are all gone. And there's one still going in Belfast, and Shannon Whelan was running it. And this is his uh, account of going to teach a class in 1922 uh, when bullets fled around <laughs> And this is the this is from stage of it. When the tram was approaching the corner of Tanzania Street, it stopped suddenly, and the conductor told the few passengers who were on it to crouch down low and stay like that until the corner had been passed. There were snipers. Royal Avenue was almost as empty of pedestrians as any mountain path between midnight and daytime. When they would see, uh, they would do a bit of a crossing tenders, this is what the, 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 the police and the, and the, police and the uh, army would be in. I'd hide in the doorway of the nearest shop. So, and he went down, he went all the way down to Donegal Street, the, the Christian Brothers um, uh, School in Donegal Street, lit the fire and waited for people to turn up. And of course, nobody turned up, but he was there to teach the class if anybody did turn up. So you're talking about something that came to a really, really low ebb. That's in terms of the language community or the language, the activists, the, the language movement is at an extraordinary low ebb. You also had a new government in this period. And the new government was not wildly enthusiastic about Irish either. <laughs> but basically, that's Lord Londonderry on top, right? uh, 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 some distant relation of, of Winston Churchill and, and later to become a, a well-known fascist. Um, not, he wasn't signed on the, on, the, on the German question, but he was Minister of Education in the 1920s. And this is his notion of the Irish language. Mm. Uh, this is Basil Brook, later, later Lord Brookborough. Uh, and this is Eddie Magateer, the, the nationalist, leader of the Nationalist Party, get up and storm. They used to do this every so often, said a few words of Irish. And uh, um, then you get shouted down by, by Basil Brook and the Minister of Education. And then later did again, Brian Faulkner. I think that was either doing Patrick and Uri that were trying to set up the street signs in, 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 in Irish. And then, then in the following year, they actually passed, uh, that year they passed a law banning the use of street signs in Irish that was only rescinded for you recently. And this is, if you, this is the last thing I'm going to show, I'm going to finish here. Uh, he was under pressure to ban the teaching of Irish, and he said it was stimulated to such an extent that there were dogs in Belfast. And the fault of dogs and bargainers. I have stolen this quotation from Liam Andrews, who will be actually talking about the language in the new state uh, at some date in the future, I believe, in, 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 in January. 
and is a proper expert. <laughs> I mean, like, 